Hey, good morning everyone, and welcome to Calvary Baptist Church for Church Online this morning. I'm Pastor Curtis, and we're so glad that you could join us this morning for worship, and whether you're watching at home, whether you're um, watching in the car maybe, or you're watching this later on, maybe even at work, who knows, I don't know, maybe on a lunch break, but no matter where you are this morning watching Church Online, we're so thankful that you decided to, to tune in and see what the Lord would have for your life this morning. And so I'm going to just give us a few updates from announcements, uh, just so you know some things that are happening. And this Sunday morning, we won't have it on the online service, but Dan and Martha from the Springs Ministries are here giving a camp update at, the, uh, at Calvary's campus in person. And so I'll just continue, just um, note that, and to continue to think about how will um, you be used as we raise money this summer to send kids to camp. And so we're excited to be able to do that again this summer, um, just like normal and as we are able to. So we'd love to send kids to camp and love for you to be a part of that. I'd encourage you to go check out, if you want to know more about the Springs, go check out their website. Give it a look and see uh, maybe if you have some grandkids, some nieces and nephews, some family members you would love to see. Maybe some neighbor kids that you would love. You know what? I'll just pay for your kids to go to camp this summer. I know how crazy things have been that they would benefit from that. Something like that. Please check out their website. I do want to mention that Zoom prayer meeting this week will be at Wednesday at 7 p.m. and we, we'd love to see you out for that. I um, this past Wednesday was at a track meet Wednesday at 7 p.m. so I wasn't able to be there but, but I'm looking forward to this Wednesday at 7 p.m. to be there for that. Next Sunday, April 25th, from 1 to 3 p.m., there is a shower for Natalie O'Dell here at the church. Um, that's her wedding shower, and please join her for that. Please, um, and if, even if you can't join in for that, check out. She's registered online, I think, at Target and uh, maybe a few other places. Michelle would let you know that if you'd like to buy them a present and uh, send, start their wedding off uh, right. We're going to have an Awana mor a warning morning here in church on May 2nd to just celebrate all those Awana kids. And so that's, again, going to be a, a part of our service that will be in person. But we'd encourage you, if, if you have Awana kids, maybe to consider attending that service. Um, wear masks, sit in our um, more spaced out area or one of our spaced out pews. But if you have Awana kids who worked hard and have earned those prizes in the past, we'd love to see you there at that. Sunday, May 9th, is Mother's Day, and I just thought I would mention that to you, for you fathers out there who might need to do something for Mother's Day, for you kids and family members who might not need to think about uh, mom on Mother's Day and get her a present or send her a thank you card in the mail, whatever it might be. But also, um, that Sunday... For Mother's Day, Baccalaureate will be here at the church on Sunday evening on Mother's Day. It's an unfortunate that it falls that day, but that's just how it works in the calendar this year. So, But Baccalaureate will be here celebrating those seniors. If you'd like to take part in that or be here for that, you're welcome to it. And then the last thing, if you have the bulletin there in front of you, the last thing you'll notice is a thank you note from Annalise and I, um, just from the baby shower this past weekend, we are overwhelmed with the blessing it is to be a part of Calvary Baptist Church, and, and some of you I know who um, sent us presents in the mail, thank you, we really appreciate that, and uh, we're blessed to be a part of this church family. So that kind of does it by way of announcements. Um, you know, we've got an, an, an annual, a quarterly, quarterly meeting coming up in May. We've got a few other things coming up around the corner for church, but that sort of will do it for the announcements other than to just be thinking about and praying for. I'd encourage you, pray for youth group tonight. We'll have youth group um, Sunday night just like normal, and I'd, I'd love for you to be praying for the teenagers. And then another thing, a big prayer need for our church, and maybe Pastor will mention this in the online service too, but Richard Stafford, as many of you know, passed away on Wednesday of this week, and so um, we're just praying for Carol and the, and the Stafford family in this time, and, and so please join us in that and time, you know, join us in prayer for Carol, and the Lord would comfort her heart as, as she's dealing with that loss, and so once you do that right now, will you join me in a time of prayer, and then we'll, we'll lead that into our, our time of worship this morning. Lord, thank you for this day. I do pray, Lord, there are, there are so many needs in our church. You've given us needs to consider. Lord, I pray for Donna Mockley at home, recovering from her dehydration and, and that spell she had. I, I continue to pray you'd be with her, Lord. Be with Barb Cooper, who's recovering too from a fall, and thank you for keeping her safe. 
We're praying, Lord, for Mindy's brother-in-law and um, others in our church family who have been affected and impacted with COVID and, and recovering from that. So I pray especially, though, for Mindy's brother-in-law who's receiving oxygen and, and needs that recovery. Lord, thank you for the successful surgery for Sharon Van Meter this week and that she, will, she was able to come home. And Lord, I do pray you continue to heal her body and, and uh, recover, her, though, recover her through that. Lord, we're, we're still praying. We're still praying for Zachary Redaluski, a kid in our community who just is experiencing these seizures and has no clue what they're from in the family, Lord. A little, a little sixth grader who is needing, needing the presence of God in his life. So I pray you'd be with them and pray you would, Lord, maybe use this, use this in his life in a mighty way. Father, we're praying for Bob Zinger's stepmom and continue to help her continue to help her in her, her battle, her health battle there. We're continuing to pray, um, Lord, for Diane Smith with her surgery coming up this Thursday and April 22nd um, in Grand Rapids. Lord, be with her. Help her. Uh, Lucas, who is who's going to receive this surgery. Lucas Schultz, who people know, many people from our church. And Lord, I pray you'd be with them. Lord, there's other people we, we care about, we think about. Frank Wilkerson, Nick Weatherington, Jane Underhill, uh, John, John and Wendy Patton. Lord, be with all those people. Be God of comfort to them. Be a God of peace to them. And encourage them. Encourage them in everyday, everyday life, Lord. Thank you for our church family, God. I thank you that we at Calvary Baptist Church have such a good family of believers who love each other, encourage one another. And so, Father, now I pray as we go to our time of worship and offering that we would just, um, we would just sing along with the songs today, God. Sing so faithfully to you and just praise your name as we listen to praise team and as we sing with them. Uh, Lord, just encourage our hearts and bless it. Bless you through it, Lord. May all the honor and glory for everything we do today be for you. Be unto your name, Lord. We want to lift you, God, higher and higher. We want to grow less and less for ourselves and more and more for you. So help us to do that this morning, Lord. Help us to use our tithe and offering time as well as a time to sacrificially give back to you and to say, you know what? We praise you, God. We trust you with our money. We know you're in control anyway, and so please help us, Lord. Lord, help our country too with COVID. You know, everything is so confusing. Everything is so hard right now with COVID. I just pray that you would, you would protect our country, lift people up who need to be lifted up, and heal people who need to be healed, Lord, but also bring this to an end sometime soon. May, may you continue to make medical advances through people that would eventually bring this to an end. Or maybe, Lord, you would just take the virus away just as fast as it came. And that's what we pray to. Thank you for this day and this time to celebrate and worship as a church. And I, I pray for this body of believers. We will all turn to you this week and uh, with arms open wide, ready to receive whatever you have for us. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, praise team will come up now and lead us in a time of worship. I really hope you have a great, amazing week. And if you, if you need anything, if you want to reach out to us at church, please do that. Give us a phone call. We'd love to hear from you. Love to know how we can be praying for you. Lord bless you this week. We're glad you're here this morning as we start to worship. We're going to start out with standing on the promise. We're going to be reminded of God's promises. So let's stand as we sing. Oh, 
this morning say amen amen well good morning everyone really glad that you have decided to uh, join us this morning uh, for the sermon time we're in the middle of a sermon series called comfort amid chaos which is a study through first and second thessalonians uh, if you have the YouVersion app on your phone, you can access the sermon notes just by searching the events section there for Calvary Baptist Church of Everett. Or if you would go to our church website right on the front page there below this video, uh, you will find links to the sermon notes and also uh, links to the church bulletin. I thought I'd start today's uh, sermon with a little story. Uh, the story is told about how on the outskirts of a small town there was uh, a great big old pecan tree that... Uh, resided just a little ways inside the fence of a cemetery. And one day there was two boys out doing what boys do, and they ended up down by that, by that tree and filled up a whole bucket full of nuts and just sat down out of sight, you know, behind the massive trunk and began dividing up the nuts. And you could hear them say, one for you, one for me, one for you, one for me. Uh, in the process of divvying up those nuts, several of them dropped and rolled down toward the fence. And meanwhile, the story's told that another little boy came riding along the road on his bike. And, and as he passed that cemetery, he thought for sure he heard voices. And of course, it caused him to slow down and investigate. And as he did, he heard this voice saying, one for you, one for me, one for you, one for me. And he was certain that he knew exactly what was happening in there. And he jumped up back on his bike and sped off with a cloud of dust behind him. And just around the bend, came across an older man who was hobbling along the road uh, with a cane. And, and the little boy said, Mister, you gotta come, you gotta come hear this. Uh, you won't believe what I, what I just heard. Satan and the Lord are down at the cemetery dividing up the souls. Now, the man didn't really want to be bothered with it all, but the little boy was just so shaken. And, and so the two of them hobbled slowly to the cemetery and standing by the fence. Sure enough, they heard, one for you, one for me, one for you, one for me. And the old man whispered, boy, you've been telling me the truth. Let's see if we can see the Lord. And so they gripped that fence and, and tried to pull themselves up on it and hold them tightly to that wrought iron uh, bars. Uh, they just wanted to get a glimpse of the Lord when at last they heard, one for you, one for me. That's all that's here. Now, let's go get those nuts by the fence and we'll be done. <laughs> and they say the old man to beat the, the little boy on his bike back into town by at least five minutes. Well, those two had a somewhat misconstrued idea of what was happening there and how it all works. But you know what? There is a day coming when Jesus will come back for us, for his own, and he will give Satan a much freer reign on this earth for a short period of time. And, and the passage that we're going to start into today, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 to 12, is a passage that explains that prophetic content in some powerful ways. And so if you've got a Bible with you, I would invite you to engage with this by opening that or uh, finding that passage, you know, on a Bible app on your phone, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and we're going to read all of verses 1 to 12, but we're only going to look at part of that on this morning. The little letter of 2 Thessalonians uh, presents really a different focus in each chapter. In the first chapter, Paul talked a lot about uh, persecution. That's sort of center stage. Uh, the folks there were enduring this heated opposition for their commitment to follow Jesus. And that first chapter provided encouragement and reminders that they needed to hear so they would continue to persevere through what was a hard time. The second chapter that we're going to start to look at today returns to the end time themes content of uh, chapters four and five of his first letter. And it'll take a couple weeks to pull that apart a little bit. But then chapter three deals with a very practical issue 
uh, the problem of idleness, which was in a sense sort of a misplaced response uh, to their understanding, their confusion about Jesus' return. Now today, like I said, we're going to unpack uh, the first part of 2 Thessalonians 2 to 12, but I want to read all of it. So if you've got your Bible there, just follow along with me as I read. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to Him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us, whether by a prophecy or by word of mouth or by letter, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? And now you know what is holding him back, so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who hold, now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie and all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. Now, the opening lines of that fill us in on some of the backstory of the second letter. Uh, Paul had sent his first letter to answer precise questions that the folks in Thessalonica had surfaced when Timothy visited there. But now there's been this interlude, some time has passed, and word gets back that either an imposter had sent a fake letter alleging to be from Paul, or someone had given the church some faulty information saying, you know, we heard Paul said that the day of the Lord is already here. And Paul says, no, no, that's not the case at all. Now, I've got to backtrack a little bit uh, to um, what we talked about when we were covering this in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, just so we're all on the same page. The day of the Lord is an Old Testament term uh, for a future period of time that will involve God's judgment and God's blessing. It's uh, mentioned by prophets like Joel and Zephaniah and Isaiah extensively. And so it references this future time when God will judge the nations of the earth and will draw Israel back to himself um, because many of the national promises to Israel remain unfulfilled. God never makes a promise that he does not keep. And so every one of those promises God is going to fulfill in exact detail, during this period of time called the Day of the Lord. Now, the term refers to more than just one day. Uh, in fact, if you put together all of the passages that uh, reference the Day of the Lord, uh, the Day of the Lord engulfs the tribulation period, which is a period of judgment on this earth, and drawing Israel. Uh, it, it engulfs the millennial reign, the 1,000-year reign of Jesus on this earth. And it even includes the final judgments and the concluding of that time, uh, which involves the remaking of it all with the new heavens and a new earth. All of that is attached in different places in Scripture uh, to the day of the Lord. And so it all fits under that same term. But you'll notice where it all started. It all starts right after the end of the church age, which is concluded at the rapture, when Jesus returns and catches us all away. And so you notice Paul says, don't be alarmed. Don't be alarmed. Despite what you may have heard, we are not in the day of the Lord. And then the next few verses, he's going to explain why. Part of the answer involves what he extensively talks about there of the uh, uh, the Antichrist, and we're going to focus more on that next week, and so make sure you come back next week for that. But the other part of the answer is what I want to really think about today, and it's more obvious. Uh, it is that the catching away of the church happens first, and that hasn't happened yet. And so we're not in the day of the Lord. I put the title on today's sermon, What's Up Next? Because what is up next in God's prophetic calendar 
is the rapture of the church. Here's the first thing if you got those sermon notes to fill in the blanks. The rapture hadn't occurred then, and it hasn't occurred still. Uh, I want you to go back to the very first verse here, because I believe what Paul describes in the first verse is the same thing that he described in 1 Thessalonians 4. He says they're concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our, notice he includes himself in that, our being gathered to him. We ask you, brothers and sisters, not to become easily alarmed or unsettled by the teaching allegedly from us. The coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him is a description of the rapture. Now let me go back to 1 Thessalonians 4. I'll put the verses on the screen here so you don't even have to turn there. It says in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16 down to 18, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Now, both in his first letter in 1 Thessalonians 4 and right here in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 1, Paul expected to be part of it. He expected to be part of that catching up of all believers in Jesus. And so one thing that that reveals, since Paul, under the inspiration of God, twice now has written that he expected to be part of this, one thing that reveals is that there is nothing that needed to happen before that could happen then. And so, clearly, there is still nothing that needs to happen before it could happen in our time. You know, if that was true 20 years after Jesus returned, then it is still true, true today. Now, the phrase in 1 Thessalonians 4 that is translated caught up is where we get the theological label rapture from because that's the Latin translation of that, that Greek phrase. And it is the next event in God's prophetic calendar when Jesus will step down into the clouds. All true believers in Jesus will be caught away. And millions, millions of genuine believers in Christ will disappear in an instant. And the world will change. The world will change in ways more radical than it has ever changed before. Now, obviously, Paul knew that had not happened yet. It hadn't happened because he was still there and they were still there. And so why is the confusion here? Well, they, they had obviously forgotten a little bit of that truth. But it's understandable because with the persecution that they were going through, the persecution had become so, so intense it's somewhat understandable for them to buy into somebody's suggestion. You know, we must somehow have gotten things wrong with what Paul had to say, because this is so hard and people are suffering so badly that we must already be in the tribulation period. We must be already in that day of the Lord. And you know this, when, when things get hard, when stress mounts, it does stuff to you. This past Monday, I was down at the doctor for my annual checkup, and we talked about a lot of things. But something that he said I found very interesting. He mentioned that over the past nine months or so, 90% of all of his patient vis visits have included some type of uh, mental health struggle, you know, like depression or anxiety in talking to his patients. 90%, that's incredible. Um, it's been that kind of a year, and we've all felt it. We've all felt the stress, the tension, the disruption of things the way we wish they would be again. Um, and it takes a toll. And I have to think that, you know, we just, we're all in that same thing. We're all enduring that together. It affects you physically, and it affects the way you look at things. Um, so ramp that up a little bit. Imagine... Uh, enduring the threat of your very life, your livelihood, your existence even, just because you're a follower of Jesus. That had to take a toll. That had to take a toll. And that's what they, these folks were enduring. And it is also what some people around the globe today still endure. Uh, this past week, I read some statistics uh, published by Open Doors Ministry, who tracks persecution of the church around the globe. And uh, in, the, in the last year, in 2020, uh, over 340 million Christians live in places where they experience high levels of persecution and discrimination. And their definition is, you know, much more severe than what we, we might think uh, about, well, you know, I was picked on because I was a Christian. That's not, that's not it. 
and, and if you do the math, that calculates to one in eight Christians worldwide live under the threat of persecution today. Uh, last year, 4,761 Christians were killed, martyred for their faith. 4,488 churches and church buildings were attacked. 4,277 believers were detained without trial, arrested, sentenced, or imprisoned. That's happening in our world right now. And it was happening in the first century. And so it's, it's just not so surprising that these, fe these folks, they felt it so heavily. They started to question. They started to be confused. They quickly grab a false narrative. Well, maybe this is the tribulation, you know. Um, we must already be in the day of the Lord. And Paul writes to say, no, no. Um, uh, the rapture didn't happen yet. And so we can't be in the day of the Lord. Jesus will gather us away, catch us away. But there's one other reason why, and I worded it secondly, because the initial events of the day of the Lord will be unmistakable. The initial events of the day of the Lord will be unmistakable. Now, you go to verse 3. He says, Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. Now, I'm, I am going to do a little cherry picking this morning. Uh, I'm skipping over some details about this man of lawlessness because that's what next Sunday sermon is going to be all about. So you want to come back and watch that then. But Paul starts out verse 3 by saying, do not let anyone deceive you because the day of the Lord starts right, the, right at the front edge of the day of the Lord. Uh, these two things will happen. The rebellion will occur and the man of lawlessness will be revealed. Now let me pull that apart a little bit. The rebellion. There's a definite article there. This is a specific, specific rebellion. And the word that's translated rebellion in the NIV is the Greek word apostasia, where you might hear it in that, where we get apostasy from, falling away. And we often associate apostasy with those that once claimed to be a follower of Jesus, but have abandoned that, have turned their backs on him. Uh, there has been a bevy of prominent uh, defections from Christianity in the past couple of years. Well-known individuals, some that I have books on my shelf that they wrote in years past. Christian writers, speakers, musicians that for some reason in the past couple of years just decided to go public with this statement, I am no longer a Christian. Now that is apostasy. That is a falling away from faith. But I don't think that that is necessarily what Paul is talking about when he talks about the falling away, the apostasy. Um, if we understand in the timeline of when this is unfolding, it's not too hard to uh, imagine uh, what he's describing there as a very specific apostasy, a very specific rebellion against God, a very specific falling away. Uh, around the world today and around the world on the day before the rapture, there will be millions of people that call themselves Christians. Millions. Uh, many of those, I hope, uh, are authentic believers who have put their faith in Jesus alone, have a personal relationship with God that is genuine and that is real. Um, but that description does not accurately attach uh, to, to everyone. Um, who goes to church, who says they're a Christian, uh, or uh, uses that label. There is, and I want you to hear this, there is such a thing as a genuine believer in Jesus and a non-genuine believer in Jesus. Um, at the rapture of the church, that will be clarified as to who is who like no other time in all of, all of human history. Uh, every genuine believer will be caught away, will be taken up to meet the Lord in the air. And every non-genuine believer will be left here. And there will be no hiding it. There will be no going through motions at that point. And as Paul describes it here, I believe, the rebellion, the apostasy, the ultimate falling away describes what happens right at that point to those individuals left behind. Um, the day before, they would say they were Christians, I go to such and such a church, and all of that. But then everything changed. Everything changed. And there will, no doubt, be some, because the Bible describes that there will be those that will come to Christ, put their faith in the gospel, the message of Jesus during the tribulation period. No doubt there will be some that realize they're wrong and literally, finally, turn to Jesus and put their faith in Him.
in an authentic way. But many, probably most, uh, will turn away, will abandon that previous identity, uh, will rebel against God as they begin to experience the chaos of what the world is going through during those years. It will happen on such a large and worldwide scale that describing it as the rebellion, the falling away, is very fitting. And I think that's what Paul's talking about. Right after the rapture, all those that are still here that would have the day before called themselves Christians, they just turn away from it all. They turn away from Jesus. It is the, the rebellion. But then there's the second part of it. He says, the rebellion will occur and the man of lawlessness will be revealed. Now, the man of lawlessness is the term Paul uses to describe the exact same person that Daniel calls the, the little horn in some of his prophecy about the end times. John titles him the Antichrist. And Jesus referred to him as the beast in the book of Revelation. He will be a one world ruler inspired by Satan who will capitalize on the chaos of that time and set himself up as both a ruler for the world to follow and also a God for the world to worship. His fate is sealed already because the last part of the verse three that I read there, it says he is doomed to destruction. And Interesting side note, there's only one other person that's described that way, and that was Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Jesus himself, doomed to destruction. But we're going to come back next week, like I said, and look at the uh, description of this man of lawlessness. But Paul wanted them to know, hey, this sequence happens right away at the start of the day of the Lord. The rapture is followed by the rebellion against God. Uh, those that claim to follow God are, are going to turn away. They were just going through the motions before. It wasn't real for them. And now, with all that's changed, they're just going to walk away. And the man of lawlessness will be, will be revealed, will rise to power in a very brief, very brief time. Now, those are the first two phrases, but I capped them off with this last one. And this is where I want you to really think uh, closer. Uh, this last line I put on here is this. Both of those happen because the restraining influence has been taken away. If you go to verse 5, he says this. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? And now you know that what is holding him back, referring to that man of lawlessness, is so that he may be revealed at the proper time. It's all, it's all in God's plan. Verse 7. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. But the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed. So what does Paul say there? Well, first of all, he says the power of lawlessness, which is Satan himself. And that's going to come up a little bit later in this section. Uh, Satan is already at work in this world. Uh, the power behind the man of lawlessness is rampant in our culture, our world already, and we all knew that. Uh, just look around at the evil in our, in our day. But there is one who holds it back, uh, who restrains it, and he will keep doing that until he is taken out of the way. My daughter and her husband have three dogs. Um, this is a picture of Amanda with their latest edition. Uh, her name is Hazel. But these other two guys have been around a little longer. That is Avery and Harris. They like H names because uh, the cat's name is Harper. So it kind of goes all together. But with those three dogs roaming free in the house, there is no need at all for them to have any type of a security system. It's just uh, really not necessary at all. But they do have a camera. They have a camera that's set up different parts of the house uh, for a different reason, and that reason is to check on the dogs and what the dogs are doing uh, when they are away. It's kind of funny when they're up at our house, uh, they'll open up their phone and log into their, the cameras there to see what the dogs are doing when they think they can get away with it, right? You know, they're up on the furniture, they're tearing things up, they're chewing on things, and they think they can get away with it because mom and dad are not here to stop us uh, from doing that. But they're not getting away with it. They're not getting away with anything. All he's got to, Adam's got to do is scroll back on the, on the recording and he can see who did what and when they did it. Uh, Amanda and Adam can see them and it is rather humorous. Sometimes they talk to the dogs over the camera. That, uh, there's a speaker attached to the camera. 
and that kind of freaks them out a little bit at all. But the, the presence of their owners deters their behavior. Uh, the behavior they try to get away with and when those owners are not around. And if you've got a pet, you've had this, you know all about how that works. Um, now, it might not seem this way, but right now, Satan is being deterred. He's being restrained. He's being held back from doing all that he wants to do. Um, the evil that he wants to promote in this world, the chaos he would like to see happening, um, it's all being held in check. And like I said, it may not feel like it, but it is. Uh, and yet one day, one day that is going to change. These verses make it very clear. Uh, while there have been various opinions on what that restraining force is, who that restraining force is, I think there is only one possible answer. And I'm just going to point this out to you. Um, the present ministry of the Holy Spirit is the only power that is holding Satan back. Verse 7 says that there is uh, one person who is holding Satan's spread of lawlessness in this world, and once he is removed, then the lawless one will be revealed. And there is only one person with the power to limit Satan's work, and that is God himself. And in particular, uh, in the context, I think, of, of our time, is the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. The night before Jesus died, uh, the disciples extensively were taught by him in the upper room. And John chapter 14 to 17 contains all kinds of deep and important theological content. But repeatedly in that conversation, Jesus promised that once he left, he would send the Holy Spirit. And some of my favorite verses in there are these. In John 14, verses 16 and 17, it says, And I will ask the Father... And he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. Beginning in Acts 2, that promise of the Holy Spirit indwelling, being in every true believer of Jesus has been fulfilled. You can have that confidence this morning. If you have put your faith in Jesus as your Savior, the Holy Spirit is with you and is in you because Jesus promised it. Um, you're never alone. Uh, God is always with you. The Holy Spirit is in you and will give you power to live differently, uh, to live the way that God desires you live. Um, the Holy Spirit is with us and in us and active in our lives. And since that is true, drop that into the timeline here. If only genuine followers of Jesus are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and if at the rapture every genuine follower of Jesus is caught away off of this planet up into heaven, then the influence of the Holy Spirit in this world, in the indwelling believers in the church, that will change also at that moment. He will be removed in a sense at that time. Now it's true, God is present everywhere. There's no place you can go that God is not there. The Holy Spirit will still be present everywhere, including on earth during the tribulation. But his, his ministry will change. His decisions about restraining evil will change. And he will no longer restrain the influence of Satan in the world through the presence of the church during those seven years. And that fact alone, that the Holy Spirit uh, will not have the restraining uh, effect on evil and on Satan in this world. That fact alone explains the depth of darkness that will engulf the world during those years. The Holy Spirit's role as restrainer is powerful. I came across a real interesting bit of, uh, of information, a uh, historical piece. Uh, it made the claim that the single most, think about this, the single most important invention that changed the American West was the 1874 patent granted for barbed wire. And just to, you know, think about that. Some of you are farmers, some of you have cattle and that kind of thing, or been around that a lot. Um, and you can imagine what it was like with, before that, right? Uh, before that, farmers would just let their cattle graze wherever they wanted. It was kind of the ultimate uh, free range uh, type thing in the American West. As property lines became a thing, fences went up, 
but with just single strands of wire, that didn't stop uh, livestock from just plowing through that type of thing. Um, but barbed wire, barbed wire, that little barb in the wire all over the place, that changed everything. Barbed wire effectively kept animals contained. Some ranchers could enlarge the size of their herds. Uh, small time ranchers couldn't afford to stay in business uh, because they didn't own as much property or they didn't own the, the rights for grazing. And uh, obviously it radically disrupted the Native American lifestyle of just free ranging their, their animals. This one little bit of wire, it's really intriguing to think about. This one little bit of wire with the ability to restrain was a powerful instrument in changing our country's history. Now, I think that's a, an, a good illustration because the Holy Spirit is not little at all, but he is an even more powerful instrument of change, an instrument of restraint. He is holding back Satan's desires to unleash evil in this world and he is providing power for you and for me to live our lives differently, even in some wacky times, even in some challenging days. The Holy Spirit is with you. He is with me. He is in us. And he gives us the power to live differently. And I, I hope that one thing you take from this this morning is an appreciation for the Holy Spirit and a commitment to lean on him more as you go through the life that you're living. But I want to end this just this way. I put just a couple statements at the end. How to prepare, how to be ready for the end of times. And the first one is this. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Paul used that word in verse 3 about those that were telling them things that didn't match what he had told them. And I think that still happens quite a bit. Maybe more in the past year or so than ever before. Uh, people are prone to being deceived, uh, prone to deception, maybe especially when it comes to curiosity-driven topics like the end times. And I just want to challenge you, be careful. Be careful about who you listen to and what you believe, because not everyone who says they are preaching the Bible uh, is containing their message to what the Bible actually says. And I've repeatedly said that as we moved into this, this um, message series, that I'm going to tell you what does the Bible say, not what other people think that it could mean, but what does the Bible actually say? Um, not everyone who says they're preaching the Bible is containing their message to the Bible. And when you start hearing things like dates being set and identifying people as this person must be the Antichrist or attaching current events to prophetic scripture. I mean, a couple weeks ago, I looked on Twitter one day and, and Mark of the Beast, hashtag Mark of the Beast was trending. Um, that kind of stuff, it is just so spiritually reckless. Be careful. Be careful not to be deceived. But there's a greater part of this don't be deceived thing that I want to, to drive home. Um, I hope that you'll take some time this morning to examine where you are spiritually and the reality of your relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Because it is possible for a person to convince themselves that they are okay with God when they do not really have a relationship with Him at all. It's just been going through motions. It's just been doing the right thing. It's just been going to church. It's just been calling myself a Christian. But a relationship with God that is daily, that is personal, that is authentic is not present. And convincing yourself that you're okay with God when you're not okay with God is eternally dangerous. Now, like I said earlier, there is such a thing as a genuine believer in Jesus Christ and a non-genuine believer in Jesus Christ. And I want to challenge you, make sure, make sure your relationship with Jesus is real, that it's shaping who you are, that he is the one you live for. He's the one that drives what you do every day. Don't be deceived. Here's my second takeaway. Do, do be aware. Do be aware that Jesus could catch us upward at any moment. And as a result, live like one who's ready. Uh, Jesus could come back any day. If he could come back when Paul was still alive, 20 years after Jesus had returned to heaven, he could come back today. Be aware of that and live so you're ready and live with a balance. Um, I'm reading a book by Barnabas Pipers, one of the sons of 
uh, John Piper, and uh, Barnabas made this statement, and I'll share it with you as we close. He said, as Christians, we should always have an eye to the future, to the coming of Jesus. We should rest in the assurance that someday all this trouble we were promised and are experiencing will be wiped away. We should remember that this light momentary, uh, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. And that's straight from 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 17. But our future hope does not entail a mere act of waiting and pining. Yes, we yearn and ache for our true home with Christ. And when life is at its worst, our ache is the deepest. But we also live now and live fully because our assurance for the future is anchored in the past. We know that Jesus will come again because he already won the battle over sin and death on the first Good Friday and Easter Sunday. We live between Christ's first coming and his final coming. And this means we have the hope we need to truly live even while we wait. I think that gives a good balance on which to close today. Have an eye to the future. Jesus is coming back, and that could happen very soon. But live life to the fullest right now. Live life like you know Jesus died for your sins uh, and rose again to free you from sin. Uh, live like you know that he has sent his powerful Holy Spirit into your life, and you can tap into that resource all the time to live differently. Live so that your life right now shows a distinctiveness, a God orientation, a, um, a flavor that influences others uh, to be drawn to your Savior. Uh, live life now with some of the things the Holy Spirit promises to produce, love and joy and peace and patience and hope. Because we can and we should truly live even while we wait. You know, I can't fa say for certain that we are in the very last days, but I can't say for certain that you are living in the only days that you will get to live uh, your life for Jesus. Make a difference in how you live those. Make a difference for him. Live in light of the future when you'll see Jesus face to face by living right now in a way that will bring a smile. I ask you to bow your heads. Let's pray for just a moment. Father God, thank you so much uh, for the promises we have in Scripture, promises that Jesus is coming back, promises that we do not endure all the horrific things the Bible portrays will take place on this earth after the rapture. Help us to have our, our, our confidence anchored in the right things, uh, not just in you know what we hear in our world or... Uh, things that are present in our culture, but help us to anchor our confidence uh, in our relationship with you and in the truth you've revealed in your book. And Lord, I pray that this would help us this morning uh, to understand clearly what you've said and to limit what we, what we let ourselves get convinced about to that and that alone. Your word is truth, and I'm thankful for it. But Lord, one of the truths that have surfaced from this this morning is that it's possible. It's even more than possible that someone watching this this morning might call themselves a Christian, might wear that label, might say, yeah, I go to Calvary Baptist Church of Everett, and yet not really have an authentic relationship with you because they are trusting in Jesus alone for salvation and they are walking with Jesus every single day uh, and learning more and growing more as a disciple who worships, links, learns, and serves. And so, Lord, I pray that today might be a dividing line of, of, of examining that. And if there needs to be a step uh, away from a non-genuine perspective to authentic faith in Jesus, I pray that would happen. Today would be the day that that issue would be settled in hearts. Guide us, Lord. Help us live in the wacky world we live, under the power of your Holy Spirit, but live in a way that shows that we know, we know who the end of the story, we know the Savior who is rescuing us from it all. And we live so that he shows, he shows in the way we live. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Something that I have found a tremendous, cha uh, tremendous challenge about is uh, the temptation it can be, because for 10 weeks I did the same thing that many of you have been doing. Uh, I just watched church online and it's easy to let it just be some content that we consume, turn off and walk away. And, and so um, the end of today's message, I have some discussion questions, things that sort of follow this up. And I want to invite you to write these down. Uh, think about them, maybe talk with them uh, with uh, somebody around you uh, that you're watching this with this morning. So here's three, uh, three of those uh, discussion questions. First one is this, you know, ask that question, what, what's happened in this past year that has made people, you know, not necessarily you, but just think about people in general, what's happened in this past year that made people think a lot more about Jesus' return? Why is that such a big thing? Um, it's worth uh, examining. And sort of as a follow-up to that, you know, what stresses have you gone through that have really ramped up the pressure and how are you handling that? This has been such a crazy past year. And uh, it does. It does put people in a mind to think about the Lord Jesus coming back. Why is that? Uh, it might be something to, to tear apart in your mind. Here's the second one. Are there things that you've heard about Jesus' return or about the end times that have been connected by others to current events. And it just kind of makes you wonder if you're watching this with somebody else, bring it up. You know, hey, I heard this. I talked about that. I heard this person talk about that. Um, and I would invite you, I would encourage you actually, uh, because I don't always know, I don't ever know who's actually watching this. Uh, drop me an email and say, hey, pastor, I heard this. Um, and if you've got a question, you can ask me that too. Is that really the case? Is that really something that I should that uh, could be true uh, about the end times. And here's the third one. What significance does it have for your life tomorrow that the Holy Spirit is present and with you? What significance? How will your life be different because of the Holy Spirit tomorrow? If you're a genuine believer in Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit, um, and He wants to, to fill you, control you, and direct you. How will that change you tomorrow? Uh, maybe talk about that with somebody watching alongside you there. But I want you to close. I want you to close in prayer. And so just bow your heads and talk to God in a minute. But close by asking the Holy Spirit to guide you this week. Like usual, we're going to throw up some uh, announcement slides here at the end. And so I hope that you'll watch through those and, and uh, participate in anything that you can. If you live nearby Everett, within driving distance, we invite you to join us. And we have an in-person service at 1045 every Sunday morning. We'd love for you to be a part of it. But have a great week, and thanks again for joining us for Calvary's Church Online.